Welcome to GM Talk. Rob McAfee, Vice President of Sales and Turnkey Corrections. I'm joined today by some of the command staff here at the Lincoln County Jail in Newport, Oregon. I have Sergeant Josh McDowell, Sergeant Grant Jones, and Lieutenant Jamie Russell. Uh, so we're going to talk to them today about some of the challenges they face on a day-to-day basis and how they're dealing with those. But we'll start with maybe a little introduction. We'll start at the end there. And Lieutenant uh, Russell, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got to the jail industry. Good morning. Well, how I got into the jail industry, um, we're going to go way back to uh, the 1900s, as uh, my younger staff like to, to say. I started with the Sheriff's Office in 1992. No desire ever in my life to work in this profession, but um, a year, 18 months of working inside a jail, I really found my niche and thought maybe this was something I could do. Fast forward almost 32 years, here I am, still here. Um, I've been in my current position as a jail commander uh, almost 21 years. Um, still enjoy it for the most part. We have uh, some challenges that I know that we're going to talk about a little bit later in the show. Uh, but I will pass it on to Sergeant Jones. Yeah, I'm Sergeant Jones. I've been with the Sheriff's Office for uh, 14 years this week, actually. So, nice. Relatively short term in comparison to Lieutenant Russell. So. <laughs> Uh, it's just smarter than <laughs> I'm a native of Lincoln County. Um, after my college education, I um, went out into the real world and tried to find a job that I liked. And I uh, had family members involved in law enforcement. Uh, it was always kind of seemed interesting to me. So I started looking for opportunities, and Lincoln County is where I found my own. Sergeant Josh McDowell. I uh, Almost 18 years. I started in July end of July 2006 um, as a reserve patrol deputy for the sheriff's office and then um, in the middle of that program um, saw an opportunity at the jail, um, applied for the jail position, uh, got the jail position and started in, as a deputy in November of 2006 and then um, been there ever since. Yeah, it's been a great opportunity and enjoyed the challenges. Yeah. All three Lincoln County Local, like local board, local bread, all going out. Not born. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah come on. But you went to high school. Too, went to high school. Like, yeah. That's kind of the qualifier. Yeah. So, yeah. Lincoln County residents for a long time have been kind of a, you, I think, a unique situation for a lot of jails because you don't see that kind of like community growth into the position and part and and probably more invested in the jail and how it works for the, the county. Kind of thing. And also, I think that it, I mean, I've said this before, I think that Newport, just with the weather and just because it's somewhat isolated and small, yeah. it's either for you or it isn't. Yeah. Um, and so I think that it takes finding the right person that is willing to stay here and be committed to not only, you know, the, the profession, but also the community. Sure. Well, I think if, you, if you're here today, it's pretty easy to get convinced for the weather. <laughs> You were here Sunday, maybe not for five minutes, so it's one of those things. So let's talk a little bit about it. I'll start with you, President Russell. Maybe uh, one of the bigger challenges you're facing, we had a good talk with Dennis Buckmaster on one of our episodes about mental health, so um, that's certainly something we can talk about today. But what are some of the bigger challenges you're facing, and how are you guys dealing with them? So I would say from, from my level, uh, one of our biggest challenges right now is recruitment. Mm-hmm. Finding staff that want to want to work, sure. and more specifically, want to work inside a jail. As you know, Sergeant McDowell indicated, we really like to focus on our local community. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones that are grounded. Those are the ones that know about our weather weirdness, and they tend to be the ones that stay the longest sure. with with our office. So, not that we don't want to hire folks from out of the area, but historically the trend we have seen is finding housing here is a challenge. They may live in Philomath or Corvallis, commute to work every day, which is fine for six months, nine months, two years, and then it gets pretty wearing, tiring when you are working a 12 hour day and then you're adding an hour and a half on each end for for travel. So we find those folks leaving um, our office and going to a Different facility, a lot of times it's closer to home, and I, I, I can understand that. I can understand that um, spending time with family is more important than being on the road traveling all the time. Sure. 
So we have just really, really been challenged with finding people um, yeah. that want to work in this environment, really understand the inner workings of a jail and the you know the dedication and the time away from family that it takes mm -hmm. if it does take a toll on people. We're seeing kind of an average life expectancy, not literally, sure. but for employment is about three to five years. If we can get somebody past about five years, you know, maybe we're looking at a ten year career, but we are not seeing twenty five and thirty year careers anymore out of our yeah. Our, our new recruits, which is challenging in this profession. It takes a good five years to get training in and really be mm -hmm. solid and grounded in your job. Mm -hmm. So to get somebody here trained and two or three years later, mm -hmm. they're, they're leaving the profession altogether is, yeah. it can be frustrating and very challenging. Well, I, I, I mean, I know I recall, and I'm sure Josh and Grant have been here a long time, I recall being, when I was First started in 2010. When we would get a, a deputy position open, you would have 20, 25, 30, 40 applicants. And then when when I was the last year I was here in 2021, if we got three or four, we were like, okay, one of these may work out. And so that that's changed the game as well. It's not just finding people, a quantity of people, but finding somebody that can actually qualify. Correct. Yeah, we have, you know, over the years changed our process to having a posting that's continuous where people just can apply mm -hmm. anytime to having it open for three years, closing it, opening it again, closing it. I know Sergeant McDowell can speak more to this, but we get maybe a handful, maybe a handful or less of applicants that even apply. Mm -hmm. Then when they're offered a test, they don't show up. It, it, I'm not saying that our recruitment process is perfect by any means. I think we do what we can do. Um, we have started within the last year and a half doing local hiring events, yep. uh, which we have seen positive results bringing local community, local people out to kind of see what that process looks like. We offer the testing free, they don't have to pay for it. They can go through ORPAT, we can get them scheduled. For an interview quicker, expedite the process, and we have had some luck with that, but we need a lot more. Yeah. It's, I think it's a national problem, too, and, and maybe you guys can talk about a little bit as you, if you've gone around your training some of these actually various stuff and conferences and stuff like that. But is it something that you've seen around the country, like there, there's techniques that people are using that you try to apply it? Well, I can't, I can't speak for around the country, but um, I've spent enough time speaking with um, other, you know, high level. Um, correction staff members who are struggling in Oregon as well. So in, in Oregon, definitely. I mean, I, I'm sure that the trend continues across the country, but I, I definitely know all the jails in Oregon um, are experiencing the same challenges that we are. And um, you know, just recently, Grant actually um, looked at uh, one of our one of the other, I think it was Clarence County, and just kind of looked at. They had a really kind of a unique um, recruitment page, web page, and then you know they had a link to that web page and all their email correspondence. So like that, just really trying to get things out there. And so hopefully those are some things that we can we can um, add to what we're doing now. But um, I think it's just I think it's bigger than just getting your information out there. I think there's there, there's definitely challenges that I really don't even know where to begin to overcome. Mm -hmm. Just getting people to want to work and let alone in our environment. It's just very challenging right now. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. I mean, I remember um, when I first got involved in the hiring process, it was uh, I was a, um, a deputy, and I was just strictly my role was four hours for physical testing component, pure sure. testing. And we would do two blocks a day for two days straight mm -hmm. of continue, you know, testing. And I think we were at like a pool of like 70 <laughs> applicants at times. And now, I, I mean, if I get four applications in in a month yeah. of a continuous um, recruitment, then that's a big number. Yeah, I mean, if you're excited about that. Like, oh man, yeah. I have four applicants. Well, yeah, you're excited. Let alone look at qualifications yeah. or ability to pass a background assessment or anything like that. Yeah, you know, we're pretty. Um, I've developed a lot more flexibility with that initial um, that initial filter. Sure. So like. 
before a lot of these applicants were getting out, before uh, I wouldn't even take a look at it. The, the app's just like, no, because the competition's there, right? And it's like, you, you so you, you can really assess the individual's um, education, qualified experience, um, work resume, all these things. You can really, you, you can take a look at that and you can kind of say, okay, you know, measure them against each other. Now I'm looking for disqualifiers. <laughs> if there's no disqualifiers, then it's like, let's at least move them forward and start seeing there. Now we haven't lowered our hiring standards, but that in that initial level, we were like, maybe there's a, a diamond in the rough here. You know, somebody that otherwise would have gotten an opportunity. We're now like, let's, you know, let's see what we got yeah. here. Um, them building the yeah. process from that way. And that process occasionally works, but it's it's okay. the low, low yeah. batting average. Well, I think, like you said, you did 70 in two days, 10, 15 years ago. The, the hit rate may have been lower, or it might have been the same. If, it, if the hit rate was 2.5%, it still could be 2.5%, but you'd have to be 10 to get two that yes. might be qualified. So that's a, that's a whole different level of, of quality. Yeah, and we've changed, and there's been some, you know, we've recently, um, you know, I would say in the last, what, three, four years, we've added the site component, right? So we'd started, kind of, I think the writing on the wall was it was going to become sure. um, a state required. Um, so we kind of got out in front of it a little bit and shopped around, found the, what we felt was a site evaluator that kind of had the same values as our organization and whatnot. Sure. And so we started that process a little bit before it became mandatory. But, you know, it's been a tough pill to swallow, but that has created a, in it a couple different situations, some yeah. additional barriers to get over. You know, right. you think you have someone great, and the psych evaluator, excuse me, the psych evaluator disagrees. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So staffing, obviously, we like said, did a special mental health grant. Something you see as a challenge every day that you guys are facing, and how you fix with it. Well, I think. Uh, just kind of piggyback on what Josh and Russell said is kind of where we're at with staffing and I know a lot of agencies are because you know we certainly have our own issues but some larger agencies are much worse it is how do you continue a uh, level of right, quality of operations that you're accustomed mm -hmm. to given the fact that you have less manpower mm -hmm. and um, you know, I think the default is to try and put bandage on it and just have people work more. I think for us that's difficult because we work 12 hour shifts. Um, sure. So you can't necessarily have people hang over that often. Mm -hmm. um, agencies that are on eight and 10 hour shifts, it's much more uh, feasible for them to cover shifts by doing doubles. But that's yeah. the uh, design layout of our facility and the staff and requirements don't really allow that. So okay. uh, we have to look at ways to run operations differently. Mm -hmm. um, potentially cut back operations or services. You know, you have to evaluate whether you're going to reduce your jail population, reduce your daily activities. Um, I'll throw you a softball too. You kind of have to look at how technology and oh, sure. commissary services affect AIC operations yeah. too because you need to use those as components of way, way, ways to manage AICs mm -hmm. when maybe you don't have enough opportunity to allow them out of their cells for as much time as you would like. Um, so I think COVID was kind of a nice, not nice, but it was kind of a springboard <laughs> into addressing some of those things because sure. we didn't have, um, the same abilities to, uh, you know, get AICs to court, uh, and to meet providers and stuff like that. So one of the first things we started doing was, um, having iPads that our county IT department set up for like, WebEx and Zoom meetings mm -hmm. and, um, virtual visits for, you know, attorneys, providers, um, court hearings, all that stuff. So we can, you know, they can do all those things without, without requiring us to transport the AICs um, yeah. uh, to, you know, different parts of, either, whether it be the courthouse, uh, different parts of the county for medical provider visits, or even different guys for court. Yeah. Um, and then with the addition of Things like video visitations and phone calls and stuff like that. That's another way to, you know, reduce. Uh, we haven't done in-person visiting since Turkey. Right. Since we started our contract with Turkey in 2012. Yeah. Somewhere around it. Yeah. So we haven't done in-person visiting since then. So that's definitely one of those ways to reduce a labor-intensive activity. Oh, yeah. um, you know, it used to be where we did 
in person visiting only prior to Turnkey, and it was uh, you know every Saturday and Sunday you would have maybe a hundred people shuffling in and out of the building every, every you know a couple times a day, and that was very labor intensive for staff. I don't if, even if we wanted to, I don't know if we could do that now, <laughs> just given who we have. Right. So um, having video visitation has been a great benefit to us because they can continue to have that connection with their family, um, and yeah. we don't have to do the labor intensive portion uh, yeah. that is. Brings its own issues. Well, and, and, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned technology because I think we talk about it all the time. Obviously, in my role, we, we talk about how technology can help with management of your adult in custody or, or anybody that you have. But when, and, and I know this building was built in '92, the, the, the world may not know that, but, but not every jail built in 1992. So this would be a fairly new jail. And even then, in 1992, it wasn't designed with the internet or Wi-Fi or in, any of those ideas in mind. So technology can be a huge help, but it can also create some new challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah every I mean, every time you we pursue a new piece of technology or a um, new system, it's really definitely trial and error. It's not everything works perfectly the first time. Mm -hmm. um, you have to see. You know the constraints of the facility with regards to even just wireless access. You know? Yeah. Well, Wi-Fi doesn't work well in a concrete box. You no, know, we kind of laugh because we're yeah, in launching our wellness program. We have a gym. Yeah. Uh, they ordered some treadmills, so right. uh, Grant and I went back to get the treadmills in, and they're like, "We're just like, hey, we need a plug-in." And they're like, yeah. "You can't. You're out of power in the building." <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> we're out of power? I've never heard that. We were out of power. He's like, well, think about it. When this building was built, there was probably eight computers in it. And now there's like, there's probably four in this room. Yeah. You right. know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, that's, that's, there are some physical yeah. constraints. I think well, we yeah. figured it out. You can use the tread, well, treadmills as long as you're both walking, but you can't those things down. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> really blowing <laughs> fumes <laughs> down. Yeah. I don't have many people who are running on a treadmill. <laughs> that's the limitations of the structure. That's yeah. just, and that's something. I mean, really, I mean, if a building wasn't built before or after 2005, there really wouldn't be something they had. Well, and um, Oregon, I'm sure, is like a lot of places around the country where you kind of have your um, mishmash of, you have your really modernized large counties and you have very poor rural, rural counties. Um, all three of us are jail inspectors for the state of Oregon, so we go through different facilities around the state, we get to see what they're doing well or what they need to work on. Um, a lot of the smaller counties that some of them have jails and courthouses that were built at the turn of the 19th century. So it's like, you know, they've got wide, bundles of wires running along their walls and, you know, bars and chains. And so just implementing some of those things can be difficult from a yeah. physical standpoint. Yeah. But if you can figure it out, uh, it is one of those things, especially for a small county where you have... Small staffing, usually a small number of AICs, but you're limited on the things you can provide them with. It kind of expands that world, yeah. um, where you have you know people who are in cells with bars and you're down locked down for 24 hours a day, yeah. giving them access to a tablet or a kiosk in the day room or their phone uh, really allows them to uh, it kind of helps them occupy their time a little bit better. Um, you know, the whole yeah. idle hands oh, yeah. saying it's so, you know, bad ideas. That's we, yeah, we've yeah. definitely done a couple things that have helped with AIC management from um, the turnkey of devices, but we've also um, just given our, all of our AICs uh, FM radios that are yeah. attached to our TVs, but they can also get local radio stations. We pay through that for our commissary revenues, and uh, it the combination of things are really um, knocked down noise levels in our facility have kind of uh, abated some of the issues you encountered during lockdown when people don't have anything better to do. Um, and that's definitely made it easier on our staff because yeah. um, having those times where our adults in custody are engaged doing something else, I think is generally more beneficial uh, for everybody oh, sure. uh, and not just our staff, yeah. but the AFCs included. So. I'm glad you brought up the inspection piece because I think, again, it's, it, and it, my ignorance is excuse it, but it may be a rare thing where the, the, and I know Marie does inspections as well, but she not. Yeah, so the whole command staff here is, is part of the inspection team around the state. Um, 
I think that's awesome because you, you do get to go see other facilities. And I know it's common for somebody or two people in each facility to have that role, go out and do uh, Oregon State standards uh, inspections. And, and talk about that. Like, how valuable is it to you not only to go out there, but then to bring back? I, you know, I think it's very valuable. I've been involved since since the inception of the Oregon Jail Standards, um, writing them, and then being an inspector, now lead inspector. I learn, and I've been to every jail in Oregon, mm -hmm. I learn something every single time I go. And it doesn't matter if it's a jail with a population of 10 AICs right. or a jail with 1,500 AICs. Mm -hmm. You're gonna learn something, and I think that one of the biggest values to having our team go to other jails. For one, you can you can talk around the water cooler that okay, so Lincoln County is dealing with this. What about this county? Yeah, we are too. And so it's it's not we don't have to think that we're a silo and we're we're the only one in Oregon that has these problems. For the most part, our problems are very similar to problems. Or challenges that other facilities have so I think that's one of the biggest pieces of value is just seeing that we're not we're not the only facility in Oregon struggling with staffing sure you know we may not be the only facility in Oregon that's has challenges with you know, AICs and you know whatever the, the scenario is and then taking something from that and bringing it back here and maybe we implement it maybe we don't but it allows us to at least have the discussion. Mm -hmm. And it puts our staff, especially those that are doing these inspections, it gives them a better understanding of why we do what we do, how these jail standards were built, why they were built. A lot of them are legislative mandates. I mean, we all right. know that policies right. and, and statutes are written because somebody made a mistake at some point and now we have a law. Right. Now we have a policy, so I think it just really opens the eyes of our of our team to to better understand the jail environment. Yeah. Well, and I think so. It's I, I, I agree totally that you're going to bring something back from every time. How often do you find yourself taking something and saying, "No, I see you guys are dealing with it. We do it like this, and like you tell you, might help you guys." Oh, um, pretty routinely. Yeah. Um, you know you. Because the cool thing about jail standards is they're just that. They're standards that all jails have to mm -hmm. adhere to around the state. And then every time something new happens, and especially starting around 2020, we really got a big influx and a lot of new things pushed mm -hmm. pushed onto the jail. So all these different jails, various sizes and resources are all problem solving these same things. And so sometimes you go to these different jails and you have a lot of similarities and a lot of challenges in implementing new things. So you're able to kind of work with them and say, oh, well, this, we're similar in this regard, and this is how we tackled it. Um, and so that's really, I think it's beneficial for all of us, and it creates a big collaborative environment. Mm -hmm. I think it helps us all navigate the murky waters together. Um, I know I get a lot from it. Yeah. Yeah, unlike, uh, unlike in school, you don't get in trouble for copying people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. great benefit to right. pulling resources and sharing information. And, um, and literally just a week or two ago, I, I had um, command staff from a municipal jail in Oregon come and look at our facility and look at some of the things we do and try and better their processes because they're, you know, a relatively similar size facility, but they're doing some things some old school ways and wanted to kind of come up to date. And, you know, it's everything from just showing them what we do to, you know, sharing contacts with vendors and sharing contract bits and information so they, they don't have to start from zero because you know there's a lot of places that when they make the decision that they're going to start moving forward with policies procedures technology whatever it can be pretty daunting to start with a clean slate and so having a pool of resources around the state and i think oregon does a really good job of sharing and communicating amongst all the jails the command staff um we have regular meetings and i I can't say for sure, but I, I'm fairly certain that doesn't happen in every state. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, you know, some states are much much smaller, much more segmented, don't have kind of a, a structure that Oregon has. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where we kind of can raise the standard for an entire state versus just, you know, I'm just worried about my, my county. Yeah. So. There's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of power and I mean, 
lessons learned. We we all have them. We all have stories, mm -hmm. and there's there's not a need for a facility to, re, to recreate something when it's yeah. already been created. So yeah. you know, reach out, make a phone call. Yep, I'll send you that policy or send a question on listserv. Yep, we've done that. Here's what we do. Here's our. Um, it's just we we do. Surgeon John said we do work really well. We're very collaborative. A lot of other states that I've interacted with, it's more of a silo. Mm -hmm. We have a county over here that does this. We have a county over here that does this, and the two never communicate. Yeah. And it's it's unfortunate because uh, the lessons that we've all learned are, are valuable mm -hmm. valuable lessons, and to be able to share those yeah. is pretty powerful. No need to go out and make that same mistake or that same training deficiency or whatever it is. It's just let's go do that just because we won't try it. No, we already tried it. It didn't work. So. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to finish up here, but I want to know, as the three of you, long term, obviously, you know, some, of, some started in the 90s, <laughs> 19, 1900s, uh, but, um, <laughs> well, we're the same age, so it's okay. For the record, we But, not this same year. Um, so, Six <laughs> What's next in corruption? What do you see as the next big advancement, or is there one, or is it just a you know slow baby steps, or is there something you see on the horizon that's going to maybe change the way corrections is done, or going to change the way it has to be applied? Boy, you know, I I'm always surprised. Um, there's some things that I think Oregon has done a really good job of being proactive. You know, we have we have attorneys that are really watching how things are going in other states and saying, hey, we see this coming down the pipe, let's be proactive. Let's get a jail standard, let's start moving that direction. Um, and then there's a lot of, to be very honest, a lot of state unfunded mandates that get put upon us that are, you know, in, in some cases, very difficult to implement. For smaller jails, even more difficult to implement. So. I don't know. I, I really don't. I don't. Um, I was interviewing an applicant yesterday and we were joking about, you know, robots in jails. I, it's reality. It will happen one day. You will see a person working in your control room and robots will be what are going about doing medication dispensing and doing checks. I, I would have told you 20 years ago that you were crazy if you ever right. said that to me, but I think that's reality at some point. Right. When that happens, I don't know. I will be long gone. Right. We'll probably all be long out <laughs> yeah. of this profession, but I think it's reality. Yeah. Uh, I think the Oregon, um, a lot of West Coast states have kind of been on the leading edge of this. Maybe the rest of the country is not quite in the same ballpark. Um, but the general direction I see law enforcement and, and corrections headed is um, increased emphasis on diversion of breach of justice. I think the goal um, from lawmakers and maybe society in general is to keep people out of jail that don't need to be in jail, reduce jail populations. That's kind of a fine line because once you're once a jail population gets too low, you definitely hear hear opinions from people in the community that there's not enough people in jail. So it's a weird uh, dichotomy, but um, I think that's going to be more of a nationwide push. Is to, uh, Pre-trial justice diversion, yeah. keeping people out of jail. Um, you know, personally, I think the, the, the parole and probation system is something that will probably get some um, some sort of look at it in the yeah. future because that's a way uh, that's a way that people end up staying in jail for long periods of time, depending on what their charges are. You know, sometimes a long, lengthy probation period can be sure. uh, can inhibit people from getting successful and staying out of custody. So uh, things like that, I think, are going to be long-term yeah. um, kind of changes from a, a, a national standpoint of what's going to happen in law enforcement and corrections. Well, and I think that the perfect example of what Sergeant Jones said is the Measure 110 um, reform that's going on right now with Bill 4002 and what that's going to look like for us and the deflection services that are supposedly going to happen within the community. I think. We, we have an advantage in that we already have a lead program, so we have a law enforcement assisted diversion. Mm -hmm. So the deflection piece that's really articulated in this bill is what we are doing now. But obviously, it will be specific yeah. to those some of those drug charges. Um, and then, you know, when 
those come into custody, it's likely that they they won't be eligible for release. It'll be yeah. mandatory they stay in custody. Yeah. So we could see we could see an increase uh, yeah. in our jail population. Yeah. I think that again, what Sergeant Jones said with the, the parole probation, I think they're gonna see growth. They're gonna be receiving funding to have POs that are supervising these misdemeanor offenders. Okay. Where historically that hasn't happened. Right. Um, it, it will be interesting. Yeah. And for those that don't know, Measure 110 for Oregon is the infamous uh, drug decriminalization law uh, <laughs> that has since been repealed. And, yep. Uh, user level quantities of street level drugs have been recriminalized and with other rules and, and things. So it's yeah. it's its own thing. There are things that will affect law enforcement. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> probably do a few episodes on that. Yeah, I don't think we got enough time. Josh? Uh, well, I have a tough time predicting because, um, to be honest with you, like it, corrections looks nothing like it did when I started in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, that's positive. In other ways, uh, not so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, I think I definitely agree with both of them. Um, I think that you're going to, at some point, you're going to have to really ramp up what role things like AI take place, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of shoring up um, what manpower can't do and what funding can't do. I think you're also, um, again, I think the, the country has been pretty clear that they want to see a little bit more of a, a bail reform and, mm -hmm. you know, people, the, you know, diversion and, and whatnot. I agree with all that. But one of the things that I'm concerned with is I'm concerned with things being on a trajectory that are unsustainable. Um, so we're doing a lot of things that just didn't exist in jails years ago, whether it is the pretrial program, whether it's um, medication assisted treatment, the MAP programs that are being, and again, good things, uh, a big push for more mental health treatments within facilities. And so I see um, basically these corrections facilities, especially ones that are, you know, we're, we're for the most part a 50% pretrial. You know, we're not a, we're not a prison. Right. And so I see us growing beyond probably what the intent of a county jail would be. And I don't see the funding coming in. Everybody wants mental, everybody wants more mental health training and mental health resources, but nobody's paying for it. And, then, right. and they, they come to jail and then they want more treatment options within the jail medication. This is true. All these things cost money. All these yeah. things take manpower. But again, nobody's funding these things. We're not mm -hmm. seeing the revenues that we need, the staffing that we need to do these things. And so I see, I almost see some of these other things where I think they're super valuable, mm -hmm. right? But I'm not sure that as a, as a, um, as a society, they need to be all pushed. They need to be put into the jail. We need to have treatment centers. We need to have mental health centers. We need to have these things because it's kind of displacing what jails are for. Right. And I worry about the effects of that long-term. Moving forward, again, I agree with MAP programs. I agree that we need more mental health resources because we're seeing a rising needs in our populations. However, I just worry about some of that stuff displacing things, and I worry about us being able to sustain that growth um, yeah. and being able to have the resources we need so that we don't lose track of some of the core responsibilities that a, a local corrections facility has, you know, which yeah. is public, public safety. Yeah, that's right. And so I, I worry about that. I'm not sure. We'll see. Time will tell. Um, but I, I worry I kind of have a feeling that it's on a little bit of a pendulum right now. Yeah. I will say on a, on a good positive note. That wasn't positive? <laughs> from, from my standpoint, as part of the Health Bill 4002, there's $10 million allocated to jails in Oregon. Very good. Uh, I will say Sergeant Gator and myself were two of the uh, verbal testimonies for that as that bill was going through, um, giving kind of our positive on that program. So $10 million for Oregon jails. So Oregon County and municipal jails, or does it include the OC? It does not include the OC. Okay. Well, so we're hoping for about 100000 That's about what we spend a year. Okay. So. Yeah. Doing a little bit helps. Right. But to, to um, just reinforce what Sergeant McDowell's point was, yeah. all jails, I think, nationwide, you know, the primary core focus of what a jail does has slowly over the years oh. kind of um, moved away. I mean, when I started, again, in the 1900s, um, safety and security is what we did. Yeah. You know, we, we, we 
have nurses that are doing all your medication. You're, you have a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Jail deputies were jail deputies. Yeah. Today, a jail yeah. deputy is a jail deputy, a nurse, a counselor, a yeah. teacher. I mean, every yeah. hat possible they're wearing. For sure. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And I think it, it's one of those things that one of the job description at the very end says, other duties is a sign of it. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> Well, what a pleasure. Thank you all for all the valuable information. I know it's, it's valuable. Um, our, our viewers that watch the podcast and listen, so we appreciate you all spending the time with us here on Talking. Uh, I know Kylie usually does it, she's not out here in front today, but I know it's on Spotify and YouTube for, for Jail Talk podcast. I don't know all the, the apps and everything else, but I know you can find us at Jail Talk podcast on those two services. So thanks again for joining us, and we'll be back with another episode of Jail Talk soon. Thank you.